Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No Dig Market Garden Podcast, episode 26. Super excited to say that Mr. Charles Dowding is on the show today. This is one I feel like I've been sitting on for far too long because it's so good, and I greatly look forward to putting it out into the world. For those of you who don't know Mr. Dowding's work, he has written several books on no-till gardening, which he refers to as No Dig. He has a great YouTube channel, uh, and it's got a ton of information over there, and he's not just some prolific backyard gardener. Dowding started out doing no dig on a surprisingly large scale, larger than my farm and in fact larger than the vast majority of my guests on the show this year. So we talk about that. We talk about compost uh, and about his history with no dig and British intensive gardening. It's a great conversation and all the elements were against us on this one as my audio equipment, if you want to call it that, was pretty defiant. But Charles was super great about it all. However, there are some rough spots in the audio, but I was able to hire a sound engineer, shout out to my buddy Willie Breeding, whose new record Big Sky is my jam, to take out the interference and help me clean it up. So big thanks to Willie and big thanks to you for your contributions so I could kick him a few dollars for his help. Speaking of contributions, I had this whole thing I was going to say about becoming a patron and about how close we were to our goal, but we literally this morning just hit $1,000 a month, so... uh. You all are amazing. Big thanks to Tiffany Jackson of North Carolina for sending us over the top with a big pledge. And thank you to everyone out there for helping to keep this thing going. Looks like we're going to be doing a second season after all. And I am super pumped about it. If you still want to support the show, there will be at least one really cool event announced over there at patreon.com slash farmerjesse soon uh, for this fall. And patrons get first access and discounts at various levels. I'll be putting up some bonus material over there all summer, doing some no-till Q&As and that sort of stuff. Uh, you can also always Venmo us a couple bucks to no-till growers if you find something in this podcast that brings you some value. Remember, we're full-time farmers and we're doing this as much to help our own farms as to help everyone else's. That money just makes it possible and affords me to pay some folks to help me out. Anyway, thank you all, and I will get to work over the summer on an amazing season two. I have a pretty good list, but if you have any recommendations for guests or suggestions in general, shoot them to notillgrowers at gmail.com. Otherwise, as always, big shout out to our show sponsors like NeverSync Farm Course. NeverSync grosses over $350,000 on 1.5 acres, and in his online courses, Farmer Connor Crickmore has put together one of the most comprehensive guides on how it is done and how you can too. I have seen inside of it, it is not gimmicky, there's a ton of information in there, extremely valuable information, including videos but also PDFs and resource guides, and it is well laid out with contextual and practical considerations. For someone who has already been farming for 10 years, uh, and I'm talking about myself, I learned an embarrassingly large amount from my stroll around the NeverSync courses. There are over 60 hours of content, ranging from indoor tomato and cucumber production to a whole section on flowers. There are great tutorials on irrigation, wells, infrastructure, hoop house design, but don't take my word for it. You can watch some of the content for free or get an idea of what's inside the course over at NeverSyncCourses.com. This is just a great investment in your education. It will only continue to grow. Again, that's NeverSyncCourses.com. All right, enough from me. Let's get to our amazing show with Mr. Charles Dowding. Charles Dowding, welcome to the podcast. So many of our listeners might be familiar with your no-dig approach to growing vegetables, which you do such a good job of putting out into the world from your small-scale farm via YouTube and your books, but what people may not know about you is that you spend a fair amount of time doing no dig on a pretty significant production scale. And I'd love to I'd love if you could take us back through and take us back a little bit and give us a little of your history with no dig. So, yeah, Jesse, I I, I started in 1982 and was going to crop an acre and a half but didn't really know how I was going to go about it because I'd only gardened before, not market gardened. And I, that summer I'd been looking around at different organic market gardens and the thing I'd noticed more than anything was the huge amount of weeds everywhere in all of those gardens. And I just could not see how those guys were making out with that amount of weed growth. And so for me, number one priority, I wanted a system, a method, where I was not going to be submerged with weeds and always at their beck and call. 
I didn't yet know how. Uh, the first thing I did, and this is kind of ironic for no dig, was I rotivated, borrowed my, I was on, a, I grew up on a farm, I borrowed my father's tractor and rotivator, uh, like a five foot, six foot rotivator, and rotivated old pasture. It was good soil, loamy soil, stony, and uh, then I made raised beds. So the tractor work of using a rotivator to kill the grass, basically, uh, was the last time I used the tractor there. But I didn't yet know how I was going to manage in the longer term. I did know I wanted to grow on beds, and I spaded soil out of what became 24-inch wide paths onto what became 5-foot wide raised beds. Uh, that was my basic formula at that time. I wouldn't do it like that now, but this is what I was trying then. And I also had the option of a large amount of straw. My brother was uh, growing uh, dairy cows and mixed cereals on a thousand acres, and he kept offering me straw. He had more than he needed, amazingly. And uh, he wasn't organic at the time. He did go organic, actually, later when he saw the great results I was getting. Uh, but I was happy to use that straw as a mulch for my paths, not on the beds. So I, that, for me, was one aspect of keeping weeds down, weed-free paths at least, some regrowth of cereals from the straw. And then the beds, I before starting, before the renovating, I had a couple of inches of old cow manure um, applied by Mike Spreader, so that had been rotivated in. So that was my starting point of fertility, which was plenty. <laughs> it was nice soil, and year one crops were fantastic. But there was one more thing I did relating to the no-dig, and that was <coughs> come across Ruth Stout, who I'm sure many of your listeners know, and her book, inspired me, the one that's called No Work Gardening. It's not really an apt title, I feel, although I can see a point. And uh, I used that basis of her description of using hay. And much to my father's horror, um, I bought some old hay. It was rotting hay. I said, oh, why are you doing that for sir? <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't pose much for it. But anyway, I've got this big load of old, heavy, small bales of rotting hay, and I put them on a lot of my beds, not all, as a mulch, because I figured that would reduce my wheat burden the next spring and summer. So that was it, all ready to go, and to put it briefly, what I noticed was two things. One was, um, after an initial hoeing of my beds, of weeds that came up in the spring, uh, but minimal disturbance after that, I didn't actually get a lot of weeds. You know, I wasn't always chopping the soil up and everything. I, I wasn't, you know, too clued up on no dig at this point, but I could see where, where it was going. And the other thing I noticed was terrible slug problem where I, wherever I'd put hay, uh, because the hay was giving perfect habitat for little grey slugs, which for us are a huge problem in our damp climate. So I thought, right, this is it, no more hay. And I was intrigued after that to just find out more about Ruth Stout and how she could be recommending a method which encouraged slugs. Uh, you know, I looked in her book, there's the, the word slug is not even in there. She doesn't mention it. So uh, I did a bit of research and realized she's in um, in the Midwest, basically, um, hot, dry summers and cold winters, which is not favorable to slugs. So that taught me how um, in, in adapting methods or taking methods from one place to another, you, you've got to be a bit careful of, you know, whether it works in a different location kind of thing. But I can see the principle of what she's saying, surface mulching. And so I adapted that to our climate here, where spreading compost as a surface mulch, which is what I now do, works really well because it's feeding the soil, it's protecting and mulching, and it doesn't give habitat to slugs. So there you have the origins of my method. So you took that system that you developed and you turned that into a pretty sizable market garden. Can you describe what that process was like and then also what market gardening was back, was, was like back then? It's, it was intriguingly different. And one thing I noticed was, um, well, when I started, I, I didn't have a marketing plan. You know, I was a real rookie. and I was 22 years old. And I... I studied geography at university. I had no agricultural training or anything. Um, and, and I certainly hadn't got any clue about selling vegetables, but 
And my mother kept saying to me, you know, well, this is all very well. You're growing all this stuff. How are you going to sell it? And, you know, the funny thing was that pretty much as soon as I had a crop ready, the phone rang and somebody wanted to buy it. And word had got out that I was growing organically. Um, I had organic certification from the Soil Association, even despite this non-organic straw. It was a little bit more relaxed in those days. And so these organic veg were in short supply in the 1980s. That was one big difference. To be an organic grower in the 1980s, you were, you were very fringe. Uh, you were very marginal. To some people, you were a hero. To most people, you were crazy. And I was appealing to those few people who were in, in desperate need, you know, because there wasn't much organic produce. So in year one, my acre and a half very quickly sold out of everything I grew. And I thought, well, I'd better expand my operations. So I borrowed the rotavator again. Rotavator did another acre and a half and got busy with my spade that following autumn 1983. And by Christmas, I had um, altogether three acres of beds ready to crop for 1984. And let me down, the same thing happened. The phone kept ringing. And uh, I actually got in contact with us a, a guy who was selling in london he, and he happened to live in nearby so he collected the produce twice a week but you know just ideal really took it up to london it sold like hard cakes and um that that was the basis of my selling but also a lot locally actually and one thing i was also doing was i was selling boxes of veg even from 1983 and that was a totally new idea at that time uh, it's become very big since that this method of selling um and, and people thought it was very odd at first. I sold six boxes in the first year, 10 in the second year, and so on. And then it gradually grew. I was doing 100 by 1989. And uh, my whole market garden, yeah, it just kept getting bigger. And I was employing seasonal workers, like one guy in 1984, two in 1985, four by 1986. And that, that was enough. <laughs> um, I stuck at that. And they'd, they'd arrive usually March and, and leave in November. And <clears throat> they would find accommodation in the village. Um, I had access to some farm, a farm cottage. And so it all worked, you know, it kind of, they worked really nicely without any master plan. Um, and that was early organic growing. Um, the one difference also to now is that prices were higher. They weren't good even then, but um, it's incredible how there's been a pretty systematic erosion of price in real terms paid to farmers and growers. And even my father was lamenting it. He said how in the 1960s, the price he received for milk, the milk he sold, was one half of the total price paid by the customers. And by the 1980s, when we were having this conversation, it was about a third. And, and that process has continued. So at least though in the 1980s, compared to now, I could make a little more money than would be possible now. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I'm wondering... There weren't a lot of people doing organic or even no-till or anything like that at the time period. So beyond Ruth Stout, did you have other inspirations? Did you see people doing that sort of style of veg production? No, not at all. Organic was was very small and uh, right through the 80s. It, it was growing. Uh, and as a result, actually, we were all really good mates. There was something called the Organic Growers Association. I was a member and... We'd have meetings, and, and it was always fun to get together, and we very much had a common bond in everything organic. But interestingly, looking back on it, and it didn't really twig much um, in my mind at the time, was how no dig was not not really on the radar, so to speak. I mean, it, it's kind of odd. You know, I was doing, I was practicing no dig in the 1980s, but I wasn't really talking about it. I just, I would mention that, you know, I don't disturb the soil. I just mulch on the top. And I, I gave a lot of talks, actually, like to gardening clubs and things, and, and I, I would say that, and nobody really picked up on it. And, and so it was just kind of in the background. And, you know, another example is in 1988, the BBC got interested, our national television, and they filmed in August the, their main presenter, who's a very famous gardener called Jeff Hamilton, uh, journalist and gardener, lovely guy. He, we, we spent two days together, and... and Everything we discussed was the organic side of what I was doing, and there was no no mention, no question or consideration of the no dig part. Even though, you know, looking back on it now, uh, that was clearly important and a, and a big factor in how I had very few weeds, because that was something that I was famous for then, was the weed-free state of my um, seven acres it was in a, 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 the most number 
area of raised beds that I had was pretty wee free. When I wrote my first book in 2007, uh, when it came out in 2007, there, they, it had no dig in the subtitle. And that did arouse a lot of interest, more than I'd realised might be the case. So uh, I think that was when the ball started to roll a bit. Um, but even so, I, I wasn't, you know, kind of actively promoting no dig because I just didn't notice there was that much interest in it. It was just built from there. And I think the year of the soil the UN had in 2015 and suddenly everyone's getting interested in soil, that really helped because in the UK, I probably have to be careful saying this on record, but, you know, even the soil association, I felt were not really that interested in soil until more recently. They were when they started out in the 1940s and 50s and then it all got, got lost a bit to campaigning against use of chemicals and that kind of thing. But my operation has become, over the years, much more intensive and I've been working with the, the wonderful qualities of no dig, uh, the, things, the, the amazing things you can do using no dig as your basic practice, like into sowing and into planting, the fact that there's so few weeds, you know, making so many things possible to crop right the way through the season. Make sure every first crop is followed immediately by a second crop or they even overlap and so on. So basically I've scaled down and in the years 2000, well up to 2012, I was cropping an acre and now I'm cropping a quarter of an acre. And I'm selling about two thirds value-wise off a quarter of an acre compared to what I would sell off an acre. Yeah, you know, when I think about, you know, uh, sort of British agriculture, I think about the sort of intensive growing around the war times and how a lot of British growers, and you can watch these really interesting videos on YouTube about it, but these really intensive growing methods became really the standard of British growers. Um, and, it, and, and British growers in general became fairly adroit at growing on small acreage. Did any of that trickle down to your crop spacing and those sorts of things and how you actually plant your vegetables? Hey, sorry, the audio cuts out here for a second, but he says no. He says that the, the, the British growers didn't inform at all. In fact, what he says next is really interesting. You know, the internet and YouTube has, has, has helped with making us all aware of, of history like that. Uh, I think it's discussed more now than it used to be then, in fact. And, you know, just going back to the 80s um, and you mentioning the war, you know, it was people I grew up with had, had lived through World War II and were very aware of um, food shortages uh, through that and as a result of it. And that was one reason why they hated organic farming and growing because they saw it as lower yielding and basically a threat to the food supply. And that was much more of a hangover or, or an, an influence, I think, on most people um, at that time um, than, than historical farming. But actually, that's why I find it interesting to read Elliot Coleman. And funny enough, I did meet him just recently last week because he was at the Oxford Real Farming Conference. And he gave a brilliant talk. I mean, he's such a good speaker. And it covered his history and, and how he got so interested in European, actually, more than British, I would say, you know, Paris, Berlin, um, the market gardening that was going on, very intensive, rather like you mentioned, to feed huge cities and how those guys did it, using methods not dissimilar, um, but much better <laughs> than what I'm doing here. I mean, I'm not in their league, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm just getting the hang of it, of, of, of doing what they were doing. But uh, I think we also, you, you know, with something like that, you can't copy, you can't copy stuff in history because the, the situation is different. People are eating different food. There are different demands. There, there are different supplies. Those guys were using loads of horse manure, for example, just because there were loads of horses. You know, they didn't have cars in those days. And so, uh, you know, you've got to adapt everything all the time like that. And, you know, I would just add actually on the, horse manure in the UK, uh, and I, I don't know how prevalent it is in the US, but there's this horrible wheat killer made by Dow, aminopyrrolid is the active ingredient, the hormone, and it doesn't break down in the manure heap or a compost heap, it survives any composting process, it's only broken down by soil microbes, and 
It's only in, in about, I don't know, I'm guessing here a bit, but let's say 1% of UK horse manure. But that 1% is enough to cast doubts on it in many people's minds and make them hesitant to use it. And I think that is tragic because there's a really good resource that's been made uh, reduced in value by the, the selfish work of, of this one company, Dow, who, you know, this, this stuff was banned in 2009, I think it was. Then they managed, they lobbied like they always do. They got it re-allowed on condition that any farmer who uses it signs a document saying that he won't sell any produce grown with it off that farm. Clearly, that's not being enforced, and it's getting out there. But I'm only mentioning that just because, you know, in the old days, yeah, you could have used horse manure without even thinking of something like that. And now we maybe have to be just a bit more careful about our inputs. That's so interesting because I think about a lot about how there are, you know, we live in Kentucky, so we live in a, a horse state with the Kentucky Derby and the horse tracks and parks, lots of that sort of thing. And I think about that a lot, how... Um, a lot of these resources that we would generally have access to, we can't even use because of the, those, those sort of persistent chemicals, especially the broadleaf herbicides. And that there is a sort of tragic element to that. Well, what one could say, though, is that, you know, okay, so we, horse manure is not such a good option sometimes now, but one thing we have got that wasn't around so much in the old days is wood chip, like shredded wood, chopped up wood of any kind. And... That, that is is a great resource, and it's something I'm looking at more and more how to use it. Like um, this spring, I want to make a Johnson Sioux bioreactor, which I've seen on YouTube. Um, you know, that, that, there's exciting possibilities and so much still to discover about um, composting materials, how to use them to add value to soil, particularly biological value. That's what I'm really looking at, and and that's what I'm passionate about with No Dig. You know how it maintains and then improves the, the biological status of soil and microbial life and activity which then links into the fertility and the health and abundance of crops because I'm really keen to move the debate about what is soil fertility away from chemical nutrients. You know I feel that chemical companies and associated media have really hijacked that debate. You, you talk about fertility and most people seem to be programmed to think of nutrients and you know I know this from the questions I get asked regularly and they're basically people are asking the wrong question you know because they've been conditioned to believe that um, their soil needs nutrients to feed the plants and they've been steered away from the realization the much simpler and cheaper realization that no, you don't need to buy nutrients in a packet from a store. You can create them and make them available in a lively soil, which you can stimulate, often with free additions like, say, wood chips. Hey, you all, just going to jump in here real quick and get a word from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Banner Greenhouses. Banner is a family-owned certified organic vegetable and flower plant producer. This second-generation farm has been producing plant starts since 1991, and they are extremely good at it. My partner in NoTillGrowers.com, Jackson, has been using banner transplants for years. I have some banner starts in my garden as I speak. We specifically sought them out as a sponsor because of how much we love their product and know you will too. Their greenhouse is an outdoor growing area, cover over 18 acres, and enable them to provide optimum growing conditions for each cultivar. Get CCOF Certified Organic Vegetable and Flower Transplants, which now include hemp, delivered straight to your farm. It's as simple as creating an account, choosing a crop and desired plug size, then designating what week you want them to arrive. Whether you want to simplify your transplant production or don't yet have a prop house, get a better start with Banner Greenhouses. Bannergreenhouses.com Today's show is also generously and enthusiastically brought to you by Growing for Market magazine. For 28 years, Growing for Market has been the source for direct food and flower growers. All GFM content is custom written by farmers, many of them no-till farmers, and others who get their hands dirty and know what they're doing. Growing for Market does not recycle content that you have seen elsewhere. If you do farmer's market, CSA, farm stands, pick your own, flora sales, or wholesaling, your business is different from any other kind of business. Whether you're a commercial grower or just want to grow like one, subscribe to GFM for the nitty-gritty of growing, marketing, and the business of small-scale farming 10 times a year. It is available as a paper magazine, digital downline, or both. 
Subscribe to GFM for the latest on market farming. There's information on growing vegetables and flowers in every magazine, and I will add lots of good no-till articles. They were way ahead of the game on this one. Use the coupon code NOTILL, lowercase all one word, to get 20% off any subscription through growingformarket.com or call 800-307-8949. Subscribers, as always, get 20% off the carefully curated selection of books that GFM carries, including GFM editor and podcast guest Andrew Mefford's brand new book, The Organic No-Till Farming Revolution, where Mefford interviews 17 different growers using no-till and gives an overview of the techniques, providing a roadmap for anyone interested in starting a no-till farm or converting an existing one to no or less tillage. That's growingformarket.com. All right, back to Charles. Yeah, that's great. I'm actually wondering if we could get a little bit into compost. I had a couple of Patreon members of the show, uh, Jordan Deerham and John Llewellyn, who wanted me to ask you two related questions. Uh, one, how often are you adding fresh compost? And the second part would be, are you differentiating between textures of compost uh, for starting beds versus keeping them covered? So in other words, do you use different textures of compost for different purposes? My application of compost is very simple. It's once a year. <laughs> this leads back to what I was saying about, you know, compost is not, when you're adding compost, it's not like adding nutrients it's not I, I urge people not to think of it as a fertilizer it's a soil enhancer and you are adding microbes among many other things so it's it's fine to add it just once a year this links in also to you know what's an efficient way of working and when you get into the whole feeding plant scenario life gets really complicated and, you know you have to keep working out hey god this this is plants hungry feeder it needs feeding now or then again in two months whatever that sort of thing uh, whereas this process I, I'm developing it is, is, is much more about feeding the soil well it's not me who's developing it. it's been around a long time but basically you just want to really I really want people to see that as as, as the much simpler way so you spread compost once a year you, you feed your soil microbes and they carry on working throughout the year as a result um, that's it in a nutshell, if you like. Obviously, there are variations of that, small ones. But the the, the big time saving is just one application a year, even for double and triple cropping. So many beds in my garden, for example, we're clearing um, crops in the early summer, like peas, broad beans, early beetroot, carrots, salads, spinach, and so on. Twist out the plants rather than pull, disturb the soil, not very much. That all goes to compost heap. We put nothing else on and then simply re sow, replant without any addition of anything until then the following autumn or early winter. That's my preferred time. You know, it could be different in other situations. My preferred time, November, December, last clearings, apply the compost for the year. The beds are then um, covered and microbes are being fed ongoing from then and throughout the following year. You know, it, it is such a simple process. <laughs> That's one reason I love it. And um, the soil loves it too, because the, the, the thing I noticed from that, you know, one issue can be with compost that you get weed seeds. Uh, when I say compost, by the way, it can be anything decomposed. So the starting point might be animal manure. And I know this causes confusion again from questions I get asked. You know, uh, people say, can you, can you? Can you use manure in your garden to grow lettuce, for example? You know, well, the, the the key point about that question is let's get clear on the word manure. You know, what what are we talking about when when we use that word? And in a gardening and farming context, you know, surely it has to be that one is talking compost. So manure becomes compost. A one year old usually is enough. Often though, it might be older, which is fine. And so that manure is now compost. So basically, the question is. So you're using compost to feed your lettuce. Well, yeah, fine, <laughs> no problem. Um, but also it, the question should be, so you're using compost to feed the soil, which then feeds the lettuce. Yeah, that's it, got it. So, you know, that, that's what one is looking at. And, and then linking back to your other question there and, and, and about texture, which also links to, you know, different starting points of compost and what, what the ingredients are will determine the result to some extent. And like with manure, well, it very much depends on the bedding that was used. I try to avoid, say, horse manure where they have been bedded on wood shavings. Um, it's okay as much, but it, the wood 
it's kill dried off and kill dried soft wood and it tends to hang around for a long time and you end up with a surface that's kind of pure wood after a while or looks like it um not so easy say for sowing carrots you know it could still work but that's that's one one i prefer to avoid um bedding on straw if possible works well for me um, and then you know if you've got if you're using wood chip as your ingredient for compost yeah you'll have some lumps for sure bits of wood that are slower to break down than the other bits and um, generally that's fine within reason you know that like the, the surface texture of my beds i i want it to be reasonably soft uh, with not too many lumps of this or that in so that i could say draw the edge of a rake often i use to just dry the drill to sow seeds for example or i use my wooden dimmer to make a hole to pop in plants uh, without lots of bits of wood say falling into the hole or that kind of thing so you know there's all those things to consider and, and how that affects also the speed of operation because um, also going back to what i was mentioning about the price of vegetables going down in real terms and always one is looking at doing things more quickly or more efficiently i should say really so you know this whole method is incredibly efficient where you you create a bed surface of the compost mulch which is ready to sow and plant at any time at any time of year um uh, you know it's april now well for sure that's really top time to, to, to go but e e even in um, november you know say planting broad beans or something which we do here in november um just make a hole and pop them in and, and, that, and that's it or usually popping in plants rather than seeds i should say but it's it's a quick method there's there's no previous preparation beds are ready all the time and uh, like one slight drawback if you use a wood chip mulch that's not decomposed and i've heard people saying how you know planting's a bit slower because you've got to say you're using a trial to draw back the mulch a bit to pop in the plant so the roots are in contact with the lovely soil below and then you just let the wood chips come around the stem of the plant um here with the method I'm using with the compost mulch that there's none of the it doesn't matter if a bit of compost falls in the hole that's fine you know it's, there's not that differentiation really between the surface and what's going on below it's it's a very gradual gradation time so we just make holes and pop things in and, and actually the wooden dibber i mentioned to use for planting is a lot quicker i find than using a trial leaf so um, that there you have it and you know weed weed growth is very easy to control because <coughs> in the spring if the compost has weed seeds in that's this is the other aspect of compost then yeah you've got to react to <laughs> see so your garden will get taken over by weeds if there's an explosion of weed growth from seeds in the compost so uh, that's where i have a very fine bladed swivel or oscillating hoe and i tickle the surface it, you know it's a very light process it's not going into soil really just running through the surface compost half to one inch deep and looking to disturb those tiny weed seedlings at this time of year in fact you know early spring uh, even late winter in mild areas when you first see that shimmer of green that's when you need to be on it and that's my main weeding time in the year is uh, in, in our climate it's mid-march to early may and after that time i hardly do any hoeing because the the hoeing i do then takes care of all new weed seedlings emerging from the compost mulches we spread in the winter and once those seeds have germinated they've germinated and then we have a clean mulch on top and then the undisturbed soil is very happy it has no need to grow more weeds uh, you know weeds are often a, a symptom of soil needing to recover um, they're not <laughs> a problem of themselves you know they're a result of something that we've done usually so when you don't disturb soil you, you just don't get weeds because your soil doesn't need to recover and and life becomes very simple very efficient and we can concentrate on our planting and cropping okay so maybe you could take us a little bit through how you started your current gardens what that sort of entails and i'm talking kind of from scratch you start with a lawn or a pasture and then go from there what you know just what that entails and how you sort of get that set up well it depends <clears throat> this is um something i'm looking at a lot in my online course actually is you know the whole preparation what i call it now year one to differentiate from subsequent years because i think it helps to understand the process more clearly if you think in in those terms to separate out year one from subsequent years year one is the most difficult compared to subsequent years planting and cropping which you know you've just got lovely clean beds 
you sow and plant into them. Year one, though, you've got often you need to clear a lot of weeds. And when I say clear, um, I find that a tricky word, actually, or the tr process tricky to describe, because I, I don't like talking about death and killing weeds, but basically that is what one is doing. And you're doing it by depriving them of light. That, that is it in a nutshell. You know, that's the process mulching. Mulching means any surface material. And whatever material it is that you use, you are putting on the surface that's depriving any weeds that are currently there of light. And depriving any plant of light, it will take a certain amount of time to die depending on how much stored energy is in the roots. So, for example, um, I'll use some examples from here. I expect they're mostly applicable in the USA. Uh, lawn grass, you know, you've probably noticed, you guys, how in England we love our lawns. And because they're mown regularly, the weed roots are, oh, sorry, I should say the grass roots, are not very strong. Uh, this links in, you know, to the work of Joel Salatin and um, mob grazing, where you let grass and pasture grow much taller. And, and that basically that feeds the roots and allows a fantastic root system to develop. So if you've got tall weeds, they've probably got strong roots. But if you're starting with a fairly low ground cover of grass or maybe a, just a few annual weeds, even actually if it was quite a lot of annual weeds rather than perennials, that's easy. You know, like I would lay cardboard because I find that's a very effective way of guaranteeing a, a light exclusion. 100%, as long as you overlap the cardboard edges by around four to six inches. Use only brown cardboard, not no shiny stuff. Take all the tape and pull all the staples out. And it's something you need to use only in year one. I'm not talking about using cardboard every year because uh, I get asked this a lot. You know, oh, all this pollution of cardboard. I take the point. You know, cardboard does have stuff in <laughs> that we don't want. Some glues, maybe. I researched it on the internet and I cannot find reference to um, you know poison or whatever but that's up to you entirely i'm happy to use cardboard once as this initial in this initial phase year one of light deprivation and then i'll put compost on top say it was the lawn or annual weeds that i've mentioned not too vigorous two three inches of compost say um you know when i say compost going back to my original definition anything decomposed not doesn't have to be perfect but you know reasonably well decomposed and and that's it so your your lights your, your weeds are going to die your soil is going to be fed once the cardboard decomposes but one thing you can also do with this which is so nice is that you can sow and plant straight away into that compost uh, even while the cardboard is there uh, and i know that people find this puzzling because they kind of imagine the cardboard as a uh, impenetrable surface layer which it is to a point and obviously that's why we're using it to deprive the weeds of light but it doesn't last forever and say two months within two months it is soft and fibrous probably sooner actually because especially when you use it in moist conditions um, and then you put compost on top the cardboard automatically is going to be moist if it was dry when doing this I would water the compost but you don't need to otherwise and then Sorry, water the cardboard. Um, if there's enough compost on top just to get your plants growing, so that's where three inches, I would say, minimum, actually. You know, if, And if you've got poor soil, if you're starting off with poor soil, which you would know, for example, if you're, even your weeds look unhealthy and scrawny, um, or if growth in your area generally is not abundant. I'm not a great fan of soil tests, by the way. I prefer to do it by looking at plants. Uh, that's a bit of another story, but basically, if, if it pays well in year one to build up your soil fertility and the two three inches of compost i mentioned as a starting point over cardboard say i would say that's a minimum particularly for vegetables vegetables are the plants that need most fertility really of all the plants gardeners and farmers grow so you know that it's and it's really they're a high value crop uh, so it's it's worth giving them this fertility and finding enough compost to make all this possible to mean that you get great vegetables it's compost is a good investment you you might walk a bit at what you need to buy in year one uh, but it's a long-term investment that the value of that will endure for many years following so uh, you know think of it in those terms and then but you can sow and plant into that compost straight away so 
in, in my first year here, I was um, putting out compost. I wasn't always using cardboard even, actually. Um, many beds, I, I put six inches compost without cardboard below, mainly because I hadn't got enough cardboard, actually, but that's another story. <laughs> um, so, but sowing planting into that compost straight away. The weeds are still dying underneath, including perennial weeds like we have creeping buttercup, dandelions, uh, some cooch grass, and bindweed, convolvulus, those kinds of things. So it's quite persistent stuff. And some of those weeds, yeah, sure, they regrow, reappear at the surface. They grow through the compost, but in a weakened state because they've had to grow all that time before they reach light. And I, I find my experience is that Although this can initially seem daunting, I know that feeling very well, uh, if you keep at it, you will be surprised because you haven't disturbed those roots. That al it already gives them less need somehow, less impetus to, to keep regrowing. You know, the opposite of trying to dig every bit of root out, perennial weed, and, you know, massive soil disturbance, that just makes soil determined to grow weeds to recover. You're not doing any of that. So you're leaving those roots in, but they are regrowing until they run out of energy. So you keep pulling the regrowth. And how long you need to do that depends on the weeds and how strong their root system was when you mulched. And to give you some examples, I found here, um, our, our weed par excellence here in this climate on this soil is creeping buttercup. You know, they get enormous and wonderful bright yellow flowers in spring. In May, you see fields that are yellow with them. And I was getting them coming up whoa, right through my mulch in May and June, and I thought, oh my God. But I kept pulling them. Sometimes use a trowel to lever out a little bit of a bit more root down towards the bottom of that six inches of compost. And by early July, suddenly, all that regrowth of buttercup just stopped. Finished. 100% clearance of all buttercup weeds. You know, what could be better? And, and actually such a good investment of time, putting on the mulch, the compost mulch, which is also a feeding soil for years to come. So that was slowing them down. And then a, a certain amount of time, but not excessive, removing the regrowth, zero buttercups. But forever more after that. So year one, you have it. That weeding was needed. Year two, nothing subsequently. And standy lines took a bit longer. They, they stopped growing in my first year, say, during... August, late July even actually. These were vigorous dandelion roots, big fat ones. And then the, the one that gave me most pleasure was cooch grass. Now, this I know might cause confusion. To be clear, what I'm describing as cooch grass, the Latin name is Elymus repens, E L Y M U S repens. Elymus repens is cooch grass, uh, as he said, or commonly cursed at by the locals as quack grass. And it's the, the cooch part of it, like the, or the, the quality of it, is the, the stolons, the, the white, shiny, piercing roots that grow mostly horizontally quite near the surface, the top four to five inches usually, is where most cooch roots are. Uh, but it's a weed that digging gardeners and rotovators, people tilling, find really difficult to eradicate because as soon as you chop up those roots, they regrow. That's just a natural law that you can't get away from. However, mulching those roots, they give up. That is another beautiful natural law. <laughs> and so here I was finding by August, no more cooch grass. And I had been needing to pull quite a bit of regrowth of cooch leaves, the grass leaves, coming through my beds, the, the six inches of compost, and, and also through cardboard in the pathways, because this is the other vital aspect of getting ground clean, it's particularly gardeners, I think, suffer problems here because it hasn't been well described um, often in the garden media about paths and what they are. Uh, and if you don't get clean paths, say, so cooch grass is a nice example. If you leave cooch grass growing in your path, but you get your bed whistle clean, no cooch in the bed, great, but you've got cooch in the paths, well, that cooch will simply spread by those creeping stolons into your bed. So you've got to get those paths clean as well. And coming back to the cardboard, that's why in my U1 here I didn't have enough cardboard for my beds because I was concentrating on the paths. And my method for the paths, um, which I still use, you know, that was 
it was a bit of a trial run at that point, 2012, 13. Um, it's basically cardboard, thick cardboard, overlapping, laid onto whatever's growing at the time, and that's the path, and then we'd be walking on that. Not always ideal, because if, if the cardboard gets wet, your feet go through it. So, uh, use of, of thin, small wood, like wood shavings, or a bit of sawdust, say, on the uh, cardboard can help with that, uh, keeping a, a 100% light, excluding layer on top of those weeds. And then, usually about two months after applying the cardboard, say, I was putting it down February, March, then we get to April, May, the cardboard was starting to decompose, and weeds were going through. So that's the cooch grass I mentioned often, uh, dandelion, so on. So easiest method there was to simply put more cardboard on top. You know, not faff around with the weeds. It, it actually probably quicker. You know, just get hold of some cardboard. You can find it at any store. But you've got to take the tape off. That's probably what takes the time on it. And then lay it down, overlap again. So that was second application of cardboard. Homemakers first year, year one, April, May. And then I did a third application again, laying off cardboard. I never take cardboard up, you know, it just breaks down. Worms love it as it decomposes. So it's adding carbon to the soil, organic matter. Um, but like I say, just going back to the glues again, I don't know much about them. I'd like to know more. And that's why I'm just talking about cardboard for year one. So my third application in year one was during the summer, June, July. And that was it. Then um, wood shavings on top. And uh, wood is possibly, if it can be decomposed a bit first, I, I like to keep a big pile of wood, chip, wood shavings on the edge of the garden um, for use subsequently. So thinking ahead, get a delivery uh, before you need it. You know, a year is good if possible. And, and then you're already, you're spreading something already decomposed with extra value for your soil. Otherwise, it just takes longer. It's not going to cause nitrogen deprivation when applied on the surface. You know, that, that we must be clear on that one because that's often asked as well. Uh, often, though, because, you know, with digging and tilling, it's assumed always that organic matter has been incorporated into the soil. With, with this method, you're simply putting things on top of organic matter, including the wood. And wood mulches do work really well as a surface mulch. They don't deprive soil of nitrogen. So that's where I find woody mulches great for paths, and I value them a lot increasingly. You know, I'm using them more and more, actually, because I can see the, the benefit to the fungi in soil. Um, going linking into how wood decomposes when it's in a pile, say, and what I mentioned about the Johnson Soup bioreactor, you know, that process, it's all about getting wood to decompose, but not at high temperatures, not the classic hot composting. Uh, it can be still warm, for sure, but it, it's not the hot, hot. Uh, there aren't weed seeds you don't need to worry about, so that doesn't matter. You know, you don't need the heat to kill them. Uh, it's a slower process, and it's much more fungally oriented than traditional compost heaps which are more bacterial now each has its merits it's just good to be aware of, of, of the, that difference and i see wood mulches in the path you know and they kind of be decomposed wood as a way of getting good fungi going in, in the soil generally because they then spread out from the path and this also links in to how paths relate to beds because there, you know, and, and going back to what I was saying about the, the misunderstandings about paths and how they haven't been well explained, I don't think, you know, what they are. What, what is your path for? <laughs> and I think, you know, they're, they're rather, they're, they're trodden on. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're just seen as something to, um, a, a point of access to reach the beds and all the values in the beds. You know, the paths is just an inconvenience, really. Uh, but it's, well, it's convenient for, for access and that's it. But I urge gardeners and farmers to look on paths as a source of value too. I'm talking in permanent paths, by the way, you know, that I don't see any point or any reason or uh, certainly not efficient to keep moving your paths around or even actually to scrape the soil out of paths and put it on beds. I just don't feel you need to do that because as you improve the structure and fertility of your paths um, with having no weeds but woody mulches on top, that, that fertility, you know, it's all, it goes horizontally. It's not like confined to one area. Soil that has amazing um, network of like the fungi, for example, you know, the wood white web traveling thousands of miles in all directions. So, you know, don't think of a, this thing it, of applying fertility directly where roots are. They'll come and find it. And so paths, 
with, with, with you know, decent mulching, organic matter on top, the structure of the soil in them becomes beautifully open and firm, yet also springy. People often comment when they visit here, uh, or on courses, whatever, you know, that, wow, yeah, these paths are amazing, it's sort of almost like a trampoline in a mini fashion. Um, the same with the beds, by the way, you know, this whole thing, how you can walk on no dig beds, because the structure is firm, you know, this is the great myth that's been sold by the rototiller companies, you know, oh, hey, you need my rototiller because you've got to get your soil loose for your, your seeds uh, uh, and your plant roots, you know, that's the biggest load of nonsense. Basically, roots love firm soil, but it needs a structure and the structure is provided by soil life which would be killed by the tilling you know so this is where it all links together and becomes so interesting when you see the bigger picture and the soil march in the path making the path soil beautifully open means that plant roots can access it to find both soil and moisture and the moisture is an interesting one because last summer we had an unusually dry summer yeah, yeah even in the uk it stopped raining for a while. We had um, a tenth of an inch in June, actually. That, that was dramatic. And then, like, an inch in July. We did have three inches in August, so we were lucky there. Uh, but most of the summer was dry, and then it carried on being dry September, October. So that was pretty unusual. And what I noticed was, like, say, by late July, we were making new plantings in very dry soil because we'd already had, say, a crop of peas or broad beans, farmer beans. And these plants, we were watering the new transplants because they were just frazzled otherwise, but we didn't have enough water. Um, I haven't got an irrigation system here, because I'm not watering a lot, actually. That's another beauty of no dig. It definitely reduces the watering. But we water plants until I could see they're established and they've got their roots down. And then subsequently, what I noticed was very strong difference between growth of plants in the sides of the beds compared to the middle of the beds. And if you didn't realise how valuable paths can be, you'd think always that the Plants in the middle of a bed would be stronger and lusher because, you know, hey, they've got more compost. They're, they're right in the middle there where all the goodness is most concentrated compared to the edge. But the edge plants last summer, in every case, beetroot, chicory, lettuce, whatever it was, were bigger. No, you know, twice the size. And every time it rained, I reckon what was happening was that they could just send out their little roots because, you know, rooting is often quite temporary uh, into the paths. The surface of the paths and amongst all that woody mulch and even a bit below that and just pick up that moisture which the plants in the middle couldn't do so you know there's a beautiful example of the value of paths and um yeah i encourage anyone to to, to 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 always bear that in mind it also links to not having wooden sides um you know the, the, this is again a misunderstanding I, I don't know if it's so true in the us but here in the uk you mention, you say the word beds to most gardeners and they'll think the image in their mind will be wooden-sided raised beds. You know, that's an assumption that's made. Assumptions like this, by the way, you know, are, are a massive cause of misunderstanding because often people don't realise they're making these assumptions, but they just are because they're assumptions. So you've got this wooden-sided raised bed thought and, and if you have wooden sides, that makes it more difficult for plants to root into the paths and you can save money time and also slugs by, and wood lice actually by, uh, by not having wooden sides so I've here I've got just two beds with wooden sides which are my trial beds dig no dig all my other beds don't have sides they have temporary sides in year one to contain the compost that's one another difference with year one and subsequent years but ongoing no wooden sides and that makes life a lot easier and it also means that plant roots are freer to travel into the paths and the wonderful soil that's in pathways. That was a bit of a, <laughs> a monologue there, but I hope that's given you a, a, a nice view. I love that. I love that you spent so much time talking about paths because that's certainly something that we overlook in the literature and just in our conversations about no-till farming in general. But before I let you go, I want to hear about your online courses. Right. Thank you. Well, I do have a, a the garden here, I call it a garden, by the way, it's interesting, the, the difference in words between garden and farm. And um, here in the UK, generally, anything under about, uh, well, about the size I'm at is called a garden. Uh, when you're more than half an acre, say, then it's a farm. But we tend to keep the farm word for strictly commercial operations. Um, so I think of this, although I'm commercial here, it's um, some of my living is from courses, for example, as well as from the produce I sell. 
So, um, yeah, I find day courses great because not only am I seeing people learning, but I, I get I get from it as well. You know, I, I love meeting people and, and having the discussions. And what, what, two comments I, I, I get commonly when people come on a day course here is one, uh, they've usually watched a lot of my YouTube videos and they say, wow, this garden is a lot smaller than I realized. <laughs> so uh, if you are watching the videos, um, that, you know, bear that one in mind, maybe it's, it, it is literally, it's a quarter acre, but it's quarter acre is, is in quite a few different areas. So you don't ever see a quarter of an acre altogether. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's in very sort of micro size bits. And there's one bit I call the small gun, which is just 270 square feet. And I've, I've made that as a way um, of showing what you can do in a small area. So that's very suitable for small scale gardeners. And that's on the videos as well, the small garden ones. Um, but what I've noticed with the courses is that um, two things are happening. One is that I've got a huge and growing international audience. And although we do get a lot of people from abroad, like I'm running a weekend course here in April. And of the first six bookings, two were from Iceland and two were from Sweden and the other two from the UK, you know, so it's, it's going a bit international. But particularly for you guys in the US, we, we do have some, actually, there's a lady or a couple coming on a course in February from Maryland, which is lovely. Uh, but I wouldn't suggest hopping over the Atlantic just for a course. Uh, but if you're coming, do, do look at the dates on my website, see if you could fit it in. Uh, but to be more practical about it, I, I've created this, or I'm creating, uh, it's, it's available now, the online course, and this is um, very extensive. It's a huge amount of information in there. And the, the price is, you know, affordable, around $150. <clears throat> it's not going to break your bank. And um, obviously that depends on the exchange rate, by the way, but whatever. The amount of information in it, I think, is, 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 is going to be huge for you because you've got loads of videos. Um, not, these are videos not on YouTube. I do refer also to some of the YouTube videos, which are useful as well. Uh, but we've made a lot of new videos, and there's, it's like a book that goes with it. There's around 45,000 word, words of text, <coughs> which is just cram full of information describing no dig, why it works, how it works, how you can do it, uh, with some examples of, of cropping plans for small space. Um, but it's mainly about no dig, and, and that was the fundamental and beautiful starting point for being successful and happy in your gardening and farming. Because there's no doubt about it, you know, once you get on top of the weeds, you know, that's such a key part of it. The, 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 the absence of weeds in no dig gardens, I get this feedback so much, and people saying, they, you know, I just can't believe it. Like, well, where did the weeds go? They just don't seem to want to grow anymore. And that enables you to just do everything else so well and, and grow so much more food. So, yeah, do have a look at this course because it, it will unlock, I feel, that possibility for many people. You, you'll see very clearly, I, I laid it out step by step, you know, how to go, different scenarios, different compost. There's a lesson in making compost as well, which um, all of us do differently, which is just amazingly wonderful. You know, it's, it's something that there's no rights and wrongs really, but there's so much you can just learn about the process. That's what I'm always looking to explain, and, and in the Nodig as well. Uh, the underlying process, the, the understandings is what you need. Then you need a few methods, and then crack on and develop your own methods as well. Um, so another part of my teaching that I really enjoy actually is, is this whole thing of, of getting to principles, uh, helping people to see them, and, and then realizing that, yeah, they can adapt that understanding to their situation and make it appropriate to wherever you are, you know, whatever your soul, whatever your climate, and whatever you want to eat as well. Because that's actually just one more thing I do mention in my course is rotation theory. Oh, that's a big one that's, you know, actually, I think for gardeners particularly, it's a big problem because rotation of crops is something that came from, in the UK anyway, from farming in the 1790s. I count Townsend and how he could get more crops from his lab uh, when he was grazing sheep and all that. And basically, it's not appropriate for small, smaller, intensive modern gardening with vegetables. And so I'm always urging people to, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. There's, there's value in rotation theory, but um, you don't have to have a four-year rotation. For example, I explain all that and, and how that can free you up to grow more of what you want to eat.
That's great. I appreciate that you touched on rotation theory there. Well, Charles Dowding, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. You have been such an influence to my farm and so many others. Thank you for your time and all that you do. Uh, Jesse, I'd just love to say one more thing. is um, how much I enjoy the interaction with American gardeners, uh, particularly on YouTube, and um, learning about different climates and what you're all up to. So thanks for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, absolutely. All right, if you enjoyed that episode, make sure to check out all the things that Charles has going on. He has an amazing YouTube channel. His No Dig Gardening course is available now. I will put those links in the show notes. Uh, He does a lot of events. He's doing one with the venerable Oxton Organics in September. That's over across the pond, but it is worth it if you have the money to get across the pond um, or if you already live over there. So go check that out. We hit our $1,000 a month goal on Patreon this morning, but you can still contribute to ensure that number stays there as patrons come in and out. That's patreon.com slash farmer jesse. It would be awesome to have a little buffer there, but I am not going to rant on about that. I am over the moon, you all, and I have literally never used that phrase in my life. Anyway, we will be doing a second season officially, and it will be awesome. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast, wherever you're getting this podcast, and uh, leave a review on iTunes. Otherwise, thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. We've got two more episodes. No sponsors for these last two. Just us kids. Thank you again. Sincerely. Bye. Um, Should I start again? Yeah, go ahead and start again. We'll get this, by golly.